Hello everyone, I'm GM Josh Fidel. Welcome to the strategic class. Uh, if you came to see another class, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. So today I wanted to go over this game I played in Chicago uh, from earlier this year. For some reason I've been going over my games in this class and other classes I've been going over other games. I didn't actually plan it this way, but for some reason uh, for this class I like to show whole games and I can kind of give you my perspective from not just looking over the game afterwards like I would if it was someone else's game, but I can tell you what I was thinking during the game and how I made decisions. So it kind of is a different vibe than going over someone else's game. Uh, also because it's me playing, I make lots of mistakes and you guys can correct my moves and stuff, which is also fun. So anyway, I'm black, I'm kind of, I don't want to say it's a must win game, I think it was fifth round or something. Uh, maybe sixth round, but it was a game where if I don't win this game, let's just say I'd be sad because I was already behind in the tournament. I lost in round two. I was already kind of chasing the leading pack. Uh, but basically, I'm black against an opponent who, you know, a couple hundred points lower rated than me, solid player, but someone I should be beating. So it was basically, I don't want to say a must win game because that's a little much, but, you know, a, a full point would be a lot better than a half point. So I'm giving you that perspective because it really kind of comes into play later. So my opponent always opens e4. We play a Lopez. I've been experimenting with, uh, you know, the Steinus deferred lately. Just kind of a, uh, I don't know, sort of a classic opening. But I like to play classic openings that aren't as popular. Of course, now everyone's playing it, so it's kind of annoying. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the idea of the deferred throwing an a6, by the way, does anyone know? why they do this, just to wake you up. Let's go into that. So d4 is actually not such a bad move, but it does give black a nice option here. If the bishop were here and you played a6, black white could simply take the knight, right? Now the bishop's committed to this square, so which option do I have for black here? Mm -hmm. So bishop goes back, knight takes pawn. Now, I think black, white can play c3 or a move like that and get some compensation for the pawn. Um, and it's not so bad for, for white. Uh, but there's a nice little trick if queen takes d4. I think I actually showed this in a previous lecture, so uh, you guys might be familiar. But the idea is you play c5, queen d5, and it looks like it's a draw, right? Bishop e6, check. But now, you do not play bishop e6 unless you want to torment white by repeating twice. What do you do? C4. Yes. The rook's defended. Bishop's trapped. Life is beautiful. My opponent, unfortunately, decided not to do this. He castled. I played bishop d7, c3. So this is very typical. I don't want to focus on the opening too much. Bishop g7. This is kind of what people are doing now. It used to be people would play moves like knight f6 and knight e7, but this is an attempt to be slightly more active. You're going to laugh at that claim when you see what happens later. h3, which is actually a tricky move, preventing my bishop from going to g4 later, just kind of a nice housekeeping move. I use the word housekeeping move, just it improves your position in small ways. Like you keep the bishop out, you give your king luft, just kind of a nice little move. Um, and in some positions, housekeeping moves are kind of nice because you don't have much to do, so you just improve slightly. Knight f6, rook e1. Castles, maybe d2. So there are lots of different ways to play. Uh, I chose rook e8. So rook e8 looks like just a normal developing move, but I would say this actually is a preventative move also. What does rook e8 prevent? Exactly. White would like to maneuver the knight to g3. And I've always asked this. Because uh, a lot of people kind of do this, take this for granted when they play the Roy Lopez. They're like, okay, my knight maneuvers to g3. Why are you going here? There's a pawn here restricting your knight. Why are you wasting time bringing your knight here? But there is a good reason. Exactly. This bishop now is stuck. This queen is also blocked. The knight here is not amazing, but it's out of the way. But you will find that often later in the game, you have to move this knight again because it's just hitting this pawn. It's not really that good. But in this case, white would like to be able to get this bishop out. But the problem now is I can simply take this pawn, and then this guy hangs. 
So rook e8 looks like a developing move, but it also has a direct purpose, which is it prevents knight bet. So white, of course, wants to prevent this with bishop c2. So white, black can try ideas like taking a knight before, but I didn't think they really led anywhere. And you, of course, you always have to be careful of allowing the big pawn center. So I play queen e7. This idea is not bad, but I would say it's extremely slow. My idea, though, is simply to connect my rooks. And now, there's always the idea of maybe playing bishop h6. Why would bishop h6 be a move I want to play? I have a fianchetto bishop. What am I doing with bishop h6? Yeah, I mean, like, the idea is that eventually white might try to play d5, or white might try to do something. And the idea is my rooks are kind of connected. And if I play bishop h6, I can at least trade off some pieces. I'm the one who's cramped, right? That's the main. Mm -hmm. Not just to develop the queen, but to give myself room. Right now, I don't have any room. I'm just like, you know, in a closet, right? I need to be able to get some room so my pieces can kind of get out. Um, and it's one of the drawbacks to openings like this. You have to be willing to play with less space. And part of that means you got to trade. Usually, if you don't trade anything, your pieces just roam around on the first rank, uh, which is never fun, unless you're into that sort of thing. So white played knight g3. If I try bishop h6 now, I have to watch out for moves like knight g5. And um, also, there's ideas of taking, and then this bishop can hang occasionally. I have to be a little careful. Um, so instead, and this is actually a funny moment, because I know there's a game I was following here played by uh, Andreken, who's a very strong GM. And he played rook ad8. Uh, but I was thinking here, and I'm like, man, rook ad8, then bishop g5, I have to worry about this pin. I don't want to play h6, because then my bishop has to move. So I'm like, I can do better than Andreken. And this is always a dangerous line of thinking when you uh, try to vary from your preparation. But I played a kind of an interesting move. I played king h8. But you guys are going to laugh at me so hard when you see my idea. So white played bishop g5, which is a fairly logical move. What was my plan? You're half right. Now, I remember how I said bishop g7 was the active line. You guys can feel free to laugh now. There's nothing too active about this. But my goal is just to play very, very simply in that if the position stays closed, maneuvers like this are not such a big deal, right? Yeah. Because there's nothing happening. I can take my time. I can maneuver my pieces. But the main idea is I was stuck. I didn't have anything to do in the center. So I'm trying to fix my pieces. If, if given time, like say white plays, I don't know, rook c1 or some move like this, my general plan is to play f6, bishop h6, maybe trade the bishops, queen out, knight comes out. I'm kind of holding on. Nothing is pretty. If you ask the computer, the computer's like, man, your position's ugly. But it also doesn't come up with anything that convincing. So it's all kind of possible. I also don't have to trade right away. I could play a move like this. One thing I will say, though, is that I would be very careful playing moves like this. A lot of people, they play the Lopez, and they see f5, and their eyes light up. They're like, ah, oh, Christmas, I'm going to start attacking. You have to be very careful with moves like this. Anyone can tell me why? This is all possible. You can even just open up the board. Keep in mind, I cannot take with the pawn. So if I have to take with the knight, this is already kind of ugly, right? I have split pawns, a king, weak king. But let's try your move, which I also think is very promising. No, knight, h5. knight h5 is also good. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of decent moves here, I think. Knight h5, maybe I can try e4. But even this, quite honestly, is very dangerous. Like, you see how you're launching your pawns, so you kind of feel good about yourself. But you will feel very bad if your king ends up getting stripped naked, and just running around. It's not going to be fun. So you have to be very, very careful about moves like f5. I would say that. Most players, when they start out playing these kind of positions, they rush too much. Let's face it, and I'm not going to blame you because I was the one who played this way. You played queen e7, queen f8, knight g8. Do you really want to take the initiative now? You don't quite deserve the initiative quite yet. And again, I'm talking to myself. It happens all the time. Um, but my idea, at least in the game, was to not do that, but to play f6, maneuver my knight around, play bishop here, 
and try to just do something with my life. Because honestly, in this position, I just was not sure what to do. There's just not a lot I can do that's active. But my opponent took on e5. Now, this, in some ways, this capture makes sense. Because when your opponent withdraws from the center, that's usually the moment to play in the center. He doesn't want to close the position. So opening the position is kind of logical. But it also does something for me which is very convenient. What do you think that would be? It opens the bishop. That's very true. Well, like, so I take with the knight. So what have I done? Probably he should take, right? What is he doing? How is he helping me? He's exchanging my pieces. Exactly. He's not taking advantage of my extra space. And I can tell you, and I don't know if this was his original intention or not, but in this position, he lets an instinct take over, which a lot of people, this happens, if he were playing a lower rated opponent, I doubt he would play this way. He would probably just build his position normally, which would be better. But when people play higher rated opponents, oftentimes, whether they're aggressive players or not, they often try to trade too much. They think, OK, if I trade off the pieces my opponent wants to beat me, this is going to make life harder. And that's kind of what he did. He took the pieces off. f4 is a little risky with the bishop here, so he went back, which I don't have a problem with. So I put, improved my bishop. Makes sense, right? Bishop d4, which I don't think by itself is such a bad move. Rook e7. But here, I think he took completely the wrong approach to the position. Well, you just, just play rook back to e7. Yes, so it's white's move. My idea, by the way, of rook here is I'm just going to double. Very simple, right? What would you do as white? I'm not sure the queen does a whole lot on g4. Um, it might get hit by the knight also. It's nice to bring the queen where you want to play, but you have to make sure the queen does something in particular. Sometimes it can just get hit, you know? I don't know. If I were white, I'd probably just go here. Maybe rook d1 next. Ask yourself, dude, your knight's on g8. What are you doing? If takes, then pawn takes. Hmm? h4 is possible. But you have to be careful. If you play h4, I might play knight back to f6. And then you, you can weaken yourself with moves like h4 sometimes. You have to be careful. But honestly, I would just bring my pieces to the center and ask black, what are you doing? I'm not saying my position is so bad. But it's a little bit passive. This whole knight g8 idea was a little too fanciful uh, by me. And I know you're, you're probably thinking, like, this is what you dream about, putting your knight on g8. But it's trying for too much. In any case, he helped me out. He played bishop takes bishop. Why is this bad? Exactly. Now, if he lets me, if he lets me take, it's a different story, because he plays pawn takes. Why is that so different? He has the center, and he has a better pawn structure. Even if he just plays d5 at some point, I have a weakness here, which is a really, this pawn structure, by the way, just to show you guys, takes, I'm going to play just random moves, kind of. This pawn structure is often a nightmare for black, because this pawn is very defensible, right? Whereas this pawn, black, white just triples on the c file, and basically black spends the rest of his miserable life Guarding this pawn. If you ever push it and takes, you ruin your pawn structure. Often you have to. So I'm not saying this particular position in particular is that horrible. But in general, if you're black in e5 structures, avoid this pawn structure like the plague. If your pawn is here, you have almost a Benoni, which is a totally different opening. It's a d4 opening. That's completely different. But if your pawn is here, do not get this pawn structure. Avoid. Just letting you know, I'm just saving you hours of suffering because I have suffered for many an hour with that pawn structure. So luckily, he took and played queen d4. So you can guess what mode he's in now. Trade the pieces. Let this guy try to beat me. He's the GM. I don't have to do anything. But I was actually very happy to see this <laughs> because my position, and it doesn't matter what the situation is. Honestly, if you told me, it's like a must-win game. If you win, you get thousands of dollars. If you draw, you get nothing. I would still be happy to see this. Can you tell me why that would be?
And I would say the reverse is also true. If I were white and someone told me, um, if you draw, you get thousands of dollars. Winning is no different. If you lose, you get nothing. I still would not play this way. I would play queen d2. So why is simplifying so bad? You're throwing away your advantage. Exactly. You're just throwing away the quality of your position that makes it good. In this position, if you trade off a lot of pieces, I have a potential weakness on e4, I have no weaknesses, I have rooks on doubles, what could be wrong with my position? Would I say black's better? Not really. It should still be a draw. But then, you're not playing for anything. Black, I can play this out forever. I never have to give him a draw. There are no rules like this. Not to my knowledge, anyway. I can just play this out. I can try to probe him, which is kind of what happened. I can try to see if he makes some errors. If he played queen d2, keeping the queens on, he keeps up the pressure. So basically, I, I mean, it doesn't matter who your opponent is. You could be playing Magnus Carlsen. You want to play queen d2. <laughs> Put him under pressure. Make it so that they have to first equalize in order to beat you, right? They, can't, they don't just go from being much worse or being worse to just winning, right? So make them equalize before they try to get an advantage. So this is, and I mention this just because it's a type of thinking that is so common. That happens all the time, and it's a type of thinking, if you can avoid it, it's so much better. So I, was black, uh, so I played rook a8. Of course, I don't want to take and give him the better pawn structure, right? So he plays rook e3. So now what? I have to improve my position. How do I improve my position? Yeah. Fix my stupid knight. Making mistakes is all well and good, but if you're not willing to then fix them, you're going to have an even tougher time. Um, Again, knight g8, when I played it, it had a specific purpose. It doesn't make it a good move. But quite often, when you put your knight on g8, you don't plan to leave it there. You want to improve it. So I could try. I was even vaguely considering moves like h5. But I think these moves are really bad. Because then if white just moves and doesn't trade, wait a second, why, do I have a, why, do I, why did I create a weakness over here? What was the purpose of this? So when in doubt, just improve your worst piece. This is a trick. Um, there's an author, you guys probably heard of him, Jacob Agard. He does lots of good chess books. I'd recommend them. One of his things is that one of the questions you should ask yourself in any position is what your worst piece is. And if you're not sure what to do in a position, improve your worst piece. Very rarely is it a bad choice. Um, and again, he has more specific rules. Again, some of them I follow, some of them I don't. But I use it especially when I'm stuck. If I'm stuck and I don't know what to do, I ask myself, what piece of mine is bad? Oh, I'll fix this guy. And it's just the likelihood of knight f6 being a bad move is almost zero. <laughs> just there's no way fixing a piece is going to be bad. So he plays here. So I maneuver around. And he decides to trade. I'm, of course, happy to let him trade, not just because I don't want to take to the pawn structure, but also when he takes, what happens? Exactly. Believe it or not, one of the next moves I was thinking about was even a move like king g8 just to improve my king. So I was very happy that he took. But it's still pretty much equal, right? Nothing much is happening. How am I going to beat this guy? Well, he fixes his knight. He realizes his knight needs some fixing. So here, you have a position like this, right? I technically have one weakness and only one weakness to work with. What is that? e4, right? This space advantage, I would say, is only meaningful if you actually run out of space. When there were all the pieces on the board, this space advantage was really annoying, right? Now that it's an end game, all my pieces have good squares, I don't mind. And it's one of the reasons why I don't think black's objectively better, but if you were to force me to pick a side, I would probably pick black, because I'm the only one who has something to play for here. Um, and again, as white, do not put yourself in these situations if you don't have to. Uh, but I kind of digress again. What do I do? Like, how do you, how do you work this? Because really, it's only one weakness. One weakness is very rarely enough to win a chess game, unless it's a really bad one. And this is definitely not a bad one. If given a chance, why well, can even play a move like f3? 
So what do I have to do? How can I try to do something? Possibly, but he wants to improve his knight anyway, right? So I play a5. I don't want to say this is some star move. It's just a move. I'm just giving myself a little extra queenside space, right? Putting my pawns on dark squares. I have a bishop on light squares, so I want my pawns on dark, right? That's the usual rule. But also, it kind of forces him to think because... It gives me options. First of all, does white want to play a4 or not? What do you guys think? No. Why does knight not want to play a4? Knight c5, and even if you can play b3 at some point there, but I mean, I understand now it drops a pawn maybe, although there's f3, you have to be careful <laughs> about taking this pawn because you are pinned. But uh, the point is more that I, I don't care if I can win a pawn by fours, a4 puts another pawn on light squares. And this is one of the strategic concepts when you have any kind of bishop endgame. Often it's a battle to force your opponent's pawns on the same color as their bishop. That's your main goal. Um, if you can do that, then it often means that they have to just play with kind of an ugly piece. It's not, again, it's not always enough to win, but I'm not trying, you have to realize, I'm not actually trying to win this game. That sounds misleading. Of course I'm trying to win this game. I'm just trying to do a little bit at a time. I want him to make one concession. Then maybe he'll make another concession. Then eventually maybe he'll make a weakness. Then I'm in business. <laughs> and of course, I have to not do this myself. But the point of a5 is it just gains space and it leaves myself flexible. I might want to go here. I might want to go here. I might want to go here. I don't know. Knight c5, he knows exactly how I'm attacking him, right? a5, he doesn't know yet. So he plays f3, which looks pretty safe, right? So why on earth am I playing h5? <laughs> Do tell me. So when you have a position where you're trying to win, but you're not really, don't objectively have anything, you have to ask your opponent questions. You have to force them to make decisions. With a5, I asked the question, do you want to play a4? That was an easy question. I was also improving my position, but that's an easy question. With h5, I'm asking, do you want to allow h4? He thought for a long time here. That already is a win. Because it means to him, he's not sure whether he wants to allow h4 or not. And in this case, positionally, putting the pawn on h4 makes sense, right? It's on the opposite color of the bishops. But if I play h4, I have to be careful because that pawn could become weak. If he ever gets an f4, puts a knight on f3, who knows? Honestly, I was maybe going to play with h4, but I wasn't enthusiastic about it. But my hope was not to play h4, but that he would play it. The question is, why could, how could this move possibly be bad? That's part of it. But he doesn't really want to play f4, does he? Right now, white is a very solid structure, right? The pawns may be on the same color as the bishop, but that's a, that's a granite pawn chain right there, right? If he plays f4, aha, I got my weakness, right? I may not win with that weakness, don't get me wrong, but if, I, if he plays f4, I'm happy. I'm very pleased. Because what else can I possibly play for here? G5? Definitely, not, not, not soon. <laughs> I play this move. So I have a threat, knight c4. So he was about to play knight d2, and then he hesitated. He was like, wait a second. What is the deal? So what do I play? D5, I don't know. Doesn't really threaten much. Believe it or not, this was my plan. I know, this move looks insane. But it's important that he cannot take. Boom. I'm sure I've mentioned this in every lecture I've done, because I mention this all the time. Do not forget about tactics just because it's an endgame. Tactics are available all the time. But what's the problem? What if white just ignores me? Do I have a threat? Am I going to take? What am I going to play next? And, and that, you have to admit, is very annoying, right? This pawn, white doesn't really want that. Not to mention that these pieces can't really move, right? So say he plays king f2. 
he could actually end up being very embarrassed. And now he has to pitch this one, right? So you see how quickly things get out of hand if you're not careful? So this is the idea, that f5, and also this is an important factor. Because I played h5, in this case, it's important. Because if my knight had to move back, I would just have nothing. He could play king f2 or whatever. But now, of course, knight g4, very convenient. And everything is there. Whereas if I did this without h5, h4 thrown in, this whole thing wouldn't work tactically. So h5 was kind of a trick, almost. It's like, it looks like I'm trying to play h4, but really, I want him to play h4 so tactically I can play this move. But he's like, OK, what's the big deal? I'm just going to play b3. No knight c4, no f5, because my rook's defended. So what do I do? Hmm. I don't know if a4 does that much. If I give him free time, he's just going to play maybe king, you know, something like king f2. Also, I'm not positive I want a4, b4. In some positions, I may not want my pawn here. So I don't know. It's an interesting idea, though, trying to get the a file, maybe. I will say this idea does come into play later. But, hmm? d5? d5, he can just take. There's no discovery. This rook's defended by two pieces. So I could take back, but this has not accomplished anything, right? I opened his rooks is what I did. So not what I'm looking for. b5 is possible. Uh, I have to say, the computer in this position, I remember this very distinctly, because I was like, b5, really? But it's actually interesting, because I can maybe put the pawn on b4. Because the key is that if white tries to play b4, it allows knight c4. I don't know, positionally, this move felt weird to me. Like, I would have a hard time playing b5. But it does, it is an interesting choice. Um, instead, I chose to do something slightly different. So what on earth am I doing? Basically, pretend it's black to move in that, if you can get another move, what are you doing? Yeah. I think my knight is better than white's bishop here. Especially after b3, by the way. More pawns on light squares. So. I'm not sure I would take immediately, but I wanted him to think I was going to take. <laughs> and why can't white play knight d2? Because he's scared. f5 again, right? And then he has to worry about f4, all this stuff. So he plays c4. So what on earth am I doing? Look at these lovely pawns blocking his bishop. I was feeling very pleased with myself at this moment. Too pleased, I'll be honest. Um, but in my opinion, regardless of how strong this is with best play, just objectively, it's kind of annoying to play for white now, right? If you play knight d2, there's still f5. These pawns are just in the way. So it cre it's kind of an annoyance. So OK, he plays bishop d1. This is where I feel like he starts to go wrong. When he played bishop d1, I saw his plan. His plan was to play f4 and bishop f3. What do you think I thought about this plan? To be honest, I thought he'd just play king f2. Very solid. I, can't, I, can play, I try to play different things, but I can't do a whole lot, right? The fact is, I can create, provoke b3, c4 all I want. If I can't make a breakthrough, if I can't open the position to let my pieces in, I'm still not going to win, right? But what is his idea of bishop d1? What could he be trying? I know I'm asking you to read minds a lot today, and my mind is even worse, so I uh, apologize for that. But what do you think of f4, bishop f3 as a plan? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you think it's OK? So he played this, and I kept a straight face. But in my mind, I was going, I want f4. I'm begging him to play f4. So believe it or not, my thinking on this move, some of it had to do with the fact that I did not want to disturb him from playing f4. So I might reject a move just because it sort of prevents f4. <laughs> this is actually not great thinking in general. But I would just say that. Moves like this, you do not want to discourage. When your opponent's going to make a mistake, this is a Napoleon thing, right? Don't disturb them. 
If you see your opponent's going to create a weakness, do not discourage it. Let them go ahead. I don't mean just play a nothing move, because that would look weird. But do a small improvement. Don't do anything drastic. Let them weaken their own position. It's much harder for me to create weaknesses of whites than it is for white to create them on his own. So let your opponent shoot themselves in the foot. This is a large part of winning these positions, by the way, because a lot of people don't like to just sit there. Most people, like king f2, knight d2, holding on to his position, that's hard to play, you know? A lot of people don't want to just sit there, right? They want to do something. They want to create, like, counterplay. But there are some positions you just got to sit. And if your opponent clearly does not want to sit, that's your moment to be like, okay, let them create weaknesses. I'll take care of it. So he played here. So I play a4. Your idea. Kind of annoying, right? Because he can't really, he can't move his pawn or take because this guy hangs. F4 here, I go back, and this actually happens. And now this hangs, so he doesn't want to trade this pawn for this pawn, right? That completely kills his structure. So he played bishop f3. And now what? I still can't win with just this weakness, right? He can defend it way too many times. But I've created a second front. And this is kind of the key, by the way, in any of these positions. You, need to, you can't just win with one weakness. You need to create somewhere else to play. Defending two weaknesses at the same time is when it becomes tricky. So what now? Hmm? Now I have an A file. It doesn't look like much, an E pawn and an A file. But believe me, when you start out with basically nothing, this looks like Christmas. This is like all your dreams come true. Objectively, I wouldn't say white's lost or even necessarily that close, but it's, it's getting dangerous now. And notice how all he did with this bishop d1 idea was give me another target, create more problems for him to defend. If he had left his bishop here, brought his king and knight over, even with the A file, so what? What am I going to do? There's nothing I can really do with that A file that's that extraordinary by itself. But because he gave me two things to work with, now his defensive task is a lot harder. So he played knight d2. So I tickle him a little bit. This is part of what cr provoking weaknesses is. You don't necessarily threaten anything great, but you kind of make them annoyed. Now it's like, oh, I have to kind of defend that knight. That's kind of annoying. So he plays here. Doesn't look that amazing, but it's just kind of like, you don't want to have to defend that knight forever, right? But OK, I play knight c5. And already you can tell that it's a little bit of an annoying situation, right? Um, but here, he really helps me by playing e5. And again, you'll find that this happens a lot. Part of, part of the way you win these positions, as I mentioned, is you just kind of annoy your opponent enough that eventually they make the mistakes themselves. Um, it's very hard to put pressure, put pressure, slowly increase it forever until you win. I'd say that's what the books tell you to do, but it's very rare the game ever goes that way. <laughs> Usually you put pressure, you put pressure, and eventually they kind of snap. They just don't want to sit anymore. They don't want to kind of play disciplined chess. So yeah, here, I mean, it's already very tough. But I would say that you know, white has to try g3. Well, white has to somehow hold his position together. Um, it's very difficult to do, though, because I still have f5 in the air, right? Because he has too many things hanging. So it's already a very difficult situation, I would say. I, I thought he might try b4 in some positions. But now I have knight e6 hitting, these, hitting this pawn and threatening knight d4. You can see how all these things add up, right? At first, it looked like nothing. I was working with a barely weak e4 pawn. Now he has whole, a pawn, weak pawn here. He has a weak pawn here. He has a knight that's hanging. He has to worry about the knight coming in. Problems, when you create weaknesses, your problems multiply very fast. So he decided to try e5. But now I trade. And now he has kind of a problem. He'd like to take with the knight, right? But what happens? Very simply. But now what do I take? This is actually very important. So when your position looks really good, it's easy to kind of let your guard down. 
I would actually say these are the most dangerous situations. When your opponent gives you headway, you think you're doing great, right? That's when you have to actually be most cautious. <laughs> At least for me, I find that that's when I sometimes make a mistake. My position gets better, I've built it up patiently, and then I'm like, ah, and that's usually where bad things happen. I don't necessarily sound like a pirate every time, but that's kind of where I make my mistake. And it's easy to just snap that pawn off, but of course, whoops. That would be a very sad way to lose, let me put it that way. So yes, but unfortunately, if I just take this pawn, b3 hangs next. It's just a very, very nasty position for white. So he still should have done it. He took with the pawn, which is even worse, I would say. So OK, I take here. Pawn takes. Rook d7, activating my rook, right? And again, you can see how white just has too many weaknesses. Keep in mind, these are all potential weaknesses if he's not careful. He has. You know, his, his knight is attacked, this pawn is weak. You can see how it just adds up, right? So imagine it now if his pawns were back here, <laughs> how much harder it would have been to win. So you got to remember this for if you're ever defending a position. Like, do not create weaknesses for yourself unless you're getting something clear. If after f4 he got clear activity, he started threatening me, he started attacking things, that would be different, right? But because he, all he did was create a weakness, his life just became really hard. I mean. I don't know if I could defend this position as white. It looks like a nightmare. Uh, but OK, he played knight e4. And now I have a choice. I could take on e4 or take on b3. This was a more difficult one. I, I spent a long time here. I'd say these decisions are hard because both options look really good. That actually makes it harder. If one option you're not as sure about and one looks really tasty, you're probably just going to pick the right one. <laughs> when they're both kind of tempting, that's when things can go wrong. So what would you guys do? Because I can tell you, I chose what I thought was the cleaner one, and I ended up regretting my choice almost right away. Knight takes 84 is what I did. And it looked just so nice, but honestly, taking on b3, I think I was afraid of ghosts here. I thought, well, I leave the knights on the board. I have to worry about knight f6 all the time. Knight f6 does nothing. Exactly. But if you look at it objectively, in a knight end game, these pawns he has are just weaknesses now. I mean, these guys are not strengths. These guys are all potential weaknesses. c4 is a potential weakness. It's not as clean. It's not as crisp because the knights are flying all over. You have to be careful. But I think people want to simplify too much. Sometimes they want to trade too many pieces. But honestly, you guys know that rook endings can be really hard to win sometimes, right? So there are times when you actually keep a couple pieces on the board. It makes your life easier, especially when your opponent has lots of weaknesses you can go after. Um, I thought the same would be true in the rook end game, but the rook end game turned out to be very tricky. So actually taking on b3, it's a little simpler. You just take. There's no tactics. There's no nothing. But um, it, it would have been a, probably a better choice. I think I had bad nightmares about e6 with a knight here. And I remember some game I played 50 years ago where that was annoying. I don't know. I, I can't tell you exactly. But sometimes keeping material on the board can actually help you win rather than making it um, harder. So I took rook d3. So I still win a pawn. It's not like I don't win a pawn. But life becomes kind of annoying. Plays king g2. So yeah, e6 might have annoyed me a little bit. But I think this was the idea I underestimated. I assumed that his pawns would actually be kind of weak, but this is actually really annoying. Because these pawns, technically this is weak, right? But how am I going to take advantage? His king defends both pawns. The fact that these pawns are split is not that meaningful. And I can tell you guys that when you get to a reduced rook endgame, it's very hard to win, usually. There just isn't much material. Rooks are really nasty at giving checks. I, I wasn't sure I could win this. So I was kind of happy he didn't go for e6. He played rook d4, which looks like a, better, a really nice try also. But it's not as clear. He, so this was kind of a, a difficult moment for me. Um, I thought that after rook c3, white had a draw. But I was mistaken. So my, I guess I have a two-part question here. First, find what I thought was a draw, and then find what I missed. 
because this was my plan, I should tell you, from when I traded. When I took on E4, I saw to this position, and I thought I was winning. But then I saw an idea for him I was not happy about. And yes, I do have lots of feelings. Yeah, I was really, I missed this move initially. I thought he could, he just had to play rook d7. But now I take, and this pawn looks kind of nasty, but I don't know. I didn't think it was the worst thing in the world. Um, there are some positions I could play here, uh, but now there's e7. So I have to be a little careful. So one trick I think I could play here was play this check. So the trick is that if he goes up, now I go here. And if e7, I go here, I just win. Uh, and the point of king f6, by the way, this is a very common trick. So if you haven't seen this rook endgame trick, when the pawn's pinned and you go here, the trick is that you provoke the pawn to take, and then you go back. And you see how this pawn is just nothing? That's kind of the trick. And here, I push this pawn, two connected pawns. Should be fairly easy. Um, but now he can play king f1, and now I can't do that. However, I've tricked him because of this check. Now his king has to be here. So I can't play king, f king f6 because of e7. You guys see that, right? Um, so here, maybe I even just go here, allow rook takes and king here. But the problem is this b pawn is super fast, and because his king's here, it's even quicker to win his rook, right? So sometimes these little check moves in rook endgames can make a big difference. Because if I checked him in this position, he would just go king g3, right? No problem. But because I checked him when he couldn't go to g3 for tactical reasons, he had to go to a bad square. So I actually didn't remember all this, but I did, I, I did calculate this during the game. I, I, I was using my time for something. Uh, but I did miss e6, which is not a good move to miss, guys. Don't miss e6. Uh, but I do have a solution, actually. I thought that this had to be just a draw, but it's not. And it should, it's really, it's one of those things that's kind of obvious when you see it, but for some reason when I was calculating, it didn't occur to me. So my move here is kind of forced, right? He's going to play, I mean, e, well, e7 is already a winning threat because of rook e3, rook e4, right? So I can't allow e7. So I don't have so many moves, right? What am I going to do? If king f6, he just takes. I didn't gain anything there. King f8? King f8? I don't know. Maybe even takes there. Remember, I'm not even threatening a pawn here. I thought I had to take, which I do. But I thought this had to be a draw, because I thought these pawns trade. I'm not going to win this. Three versus two with split pawns? No chance. But I actually do not have to trade these pawns here. And here I made a very common mistake. I would say even GMs make this mistake a lot, which is that we have a conceptual thing. We've seen a zillion rook endgames. We've seen that these pawns always get traded. What happens is this pawn runs, this rook runs, this pawn runs, the rook goes behind, take, 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 everyone's happy. And you don't win, because you trade these pawns, right? But when you see this, sometimes it forces you to be lazy. If I weren't lazy, what would I have seen? I know it's hard to imagine a world in which I'm not lazy, but we're going to try. E5, king e6. Um, it's similar. I mean, I, I think the better move order is just king e5. Just immediately go after the pawn. If e5, you maybe have to worry about rook check sometimes. I don't know. Your, your may might work too, but I think king e5 is even easier. And you just go over. And for some reason, I didn't see this. I didn't see, wait a second, I just go over and take this pawn. My king's m more active than white. So basically, I guess the lesson here is just don't stop when you're calculating until the very end. And don't rely on your assumptions. Just because I had seen these pawns trade before doesn't mean that this position is not different. So it's a mistake which, I mean, all, a lot of players make a lot. And it's, uh, so rook c3 would have been slightly more accurate. I played king f8. Not a horrible move, but it's very difficult to win now. So rook d7 he played, c5, b6, king g3. So here I calculated a long time. Um, of course, here I have to be careful, because if I allow the king in, who knows? <laughs> Bad things can happen. Um, so I played rook b4. 
Yeah, so this was a tricky moment. I was worried about king f4 during the game. And I wasn't sure I could do much here. But I can take and b5. And it's very important that king f6 doesn't work because of rook f4 check. But he plays f4. And now what? Very nice. Stops f5 in its tracks, right? Because the rook takes e5. Still can't go here. So rook takes pawn. Yep. And I think this was the concept I missed. If uh, b3, I might lose. You have to be very careful when this king gets in. I could do this. And it's kind of cool because it's mate. I'm threatening mate. If f6, king h7, it's still mate. And what happens if this? And this is surely what I missed. That would have been a cool way to win. Uh, but I did not see this during the game, so I was very worried. <laughs> but he played here. I took. And this was the key moment. You have to figure out how to win here. Because there are so many times you get this position, but you just can't win. So I calculated a long time, finally decided on this move. So yeah, I thought he might try king f4, but here, if e6, I always have f6. It's kind of important to keep his king out. And if here, I can play king e7. And I couldn't find a way for white to draw. But it was still probably a better try. He played rook b7. I played c4, c3, c2. But the question is, how on earth am I going to win? He plays check. So guys, wh how do you win as black? Check. Right. Uh, but let's, let me just show you. White plays check. But I had to be very careful when I did this, because if you're not accurate, you can end up losing. I've seen these rook end games lost before. I'm sure I've done it myself. But I play king d5. And then where does the king go? If I go to c5, I have to watch out for the rook d2 defense. Right? Because now if I move the rook, and my pawn can't advance. So here I can't do anything. <laughs> so yes, c4. And the idea now is if black tries to go up, my king is too close. So I play king c3, his rook goes here, my rook goes here, and I'm too fast. So king c4 is important. So he plays e6. If he plays check, how does this work? Okay. You have to be a little careful. Maybe this works. I mean, probably this will win. Yeah, it wins because you, you can do everything with check. Because if takes, queen, queen, check, yeah. I wasn't as sure about this one. Uh, my plan, just so you know, was actually just to go to b5. Because now there's no rook d2, right? So he has to move his rook somewhere, and then I push. And now he has to give up a rook, right? So he tried e6 and rook check. So now what?
botão. We trade. I bring my king back and he resigned here. But basically the idea is that with a king this close, it's very simple. You just bring the king every move. Use the rook. It's quite simple to win. But uh, the basic idea is that the rook end game became very complicated, right? This was a win, but it was really a win by one tempo. So you can see how close the rook end game is. If I had kept the knights on the board, I probably would have won more comfortably. So the temptation to simplify often has to be re resisted. But I, I could say if there's any strategic concept this whole game that you guys should take away, it's that be careful when you simplify. At the beginning of the game, he's simplified. And what happens? His advantage just went up in smoke, right? Because his advantage was based on that there were lots of pieces, and he had a space advantage. So all the trades. And then towards the end, I was the one who traded incorrectly. So there are times when you got to keep pieces on the board. you got to keep their um, things. Also, I take note of his idea of bishop d1, f4, because this is a common type of mistake. Again, you'll see it at the 2300 level more than, say, 2500 level. When they get to that level, they stop doing it a lot more. And the reason is because we just have this experience of we've been hurt so many times when we create weaknesses. So do not create weaknesses you do not have to create, uh, especially if you're not really doing anything with those moves. Uh, and I guess the other one is just be patient. You know, imagine like, okay, this is a 2300. Imagine you're playing a 2000 or an 1800. How many mistakes are they going to make in a position like that? Probably a lot more, right? So if you stay patient, you keep improving your position, you keep asking them questions, moves like h5, a5, keeping the tension, you'll often provoke mistakes in a position they shouldn't necessarily lose. Um, so you have to show patience, you have to be accurate when you know, the, the position becomes more concrete. You have to calculate variations. But essentially, be patient. Wait for them to create the weaknesses. Mm -hmm.